My name is Joseph Wunderlitz, Professor of Engineering, Architecture, and Computer Science. This is a lecture on uh, site work, site design. Um, I've been here 24 years, Elizabeth Hill College. Um, Taught at Purdue University. Before that, IBM Research, and then a whole career until I was 30. I'm 61 years old now uh, in the building industry. And I still do buildings, still did 12 residential projects over a lifetime and of uh, my own, and then uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of, or hundred million dollars worth of high tech development office parks in California and Texas. Uh, lecture series and different things. And so we're in here now, uh, we're, or actually in this course here in Architecture Studio One. And um, this is Architecture Materials and Methods. It has been in the past a separate lecture course. Uh, this is part of Studio One now, which most of the students are in it here, a couple of Studio Two. I'm putting things in uh, PowerPoints uh, with embedded audio sometimes, um, and then, PDF MP4 loaded up to the web server and then on my YouTube channel with a couple hundred things. Uh, so we're, this is now, I'm gonna work off of a PDF here. This is foundations and site work. You a book here. Yeah. So uh, site work, surveying. So you get some land and uh, you buy a lot, it's been surveyed somehow, uh, presumably, not always. So you may buy raw land and you need to survey and subdivide it yourself. You establish precise locations of land and boundaries, buildings, path roads, utilities, check elevations. Uh, you, you need to grade the site with so much cut or fill. Uh, there's two different types of uh, surveying uh, methodologies in the United States. The one is traditionally an old one where you do meets and bounds you go from creek to rock, and that was more haphazard as we expanded the United States out west uh, for the sake of uh, quick expansion and organized uh, surveying. We use rectangular coordinates where everything is on a grid following you know, essentially latitude and longitude lines and broken into smaller pieces. Um, <clears throat> So uh, there's different equipment that you use, a compass or a theodolite calling it gives you bearing, uh, the angle on the surface, digital levels, uh, elevations of distance. Um, and you, you know, you, somebody holds us a staff here and you read off of that with a precise instrument. When I took surveying class, we didn't have digital ones. We did it all hand calculations and a uh, little telescope looking thing. Uh, serving, serving equipment, so you have this little, I didn't bring them in, I have all these things, but uh, this long, very long tape measure, one that you can just roll around the perimeter of land, uh, laser distance meters, I don't have one of these actually, and I don't have an umbrella either, but, um, and then equipment that you might use. So most commonly you're going to see uh, a backhoe and, um, you know, a dump truck of some course, or and then excavators on bigger things. Trenchers are a little more rare. You typically can use a backhoe to do most of your trenching, but if you have really long trenches or you may be going through some tougher materials, you'd use that. Uh, graders, um, you can do this with your bulldozer or the front bucket of your uh, backhoe. But if you have a big site, you wanna use something more like that. Uh, skid loaders, and if you're, you're drilling for posts and things, you, know, you need something like that. And then smaller little crawlers you can use. Uh, these are more maneuverable for small for the finished landscaping, typically. You know, big bulldozers for pushing a lot. But again, you can typically do that. You, you can often get away with just a backhoe for your excavation. Uh, and if you don't have a lot of cut and fill, you don't even need a dump truck. You know. And then some basic tools, a square around, I call this a spade and it's a coal shovel, different names for things, you know, different shape. And it's good for shoveling different kinds of things. A pick, a hoe, a digging bar. This is where it comes in very handy for prying up stuff, pitchfork. Uh, this is, you wanna establish approximate locations. This is a present 
project still working on. Uh, you spray paint in the ground and the grass where you want to build, and then you start digging. And we did this by hand just for fun. Uh, dug 60 cubic yards of dirt, if you're familiar with that, by hand, my son and I. And uh, diggity dig, just hand tools. Oh, by the way, this is a 1878 big farmhouse with what they call is a summer kitchen attached, which has a big walk-in fireplace over here. And it used to have what looked like uh, places people could sleep in this warmer, smaller building during the uh, winter time. And then they built a little shed kind of thing that farmers, local farmers told me was a, uh, a slaughterhouse because they had farm animals, this agriculture zone that has a barn. And then this was an outhouse where uh, this, I built these stairs and this over here, I took out the outhouse, filled it in, sanitized it. So on foundation work, you wanna put up uh, batter boards. So you can't just rely on your spray paint on the grass to give you the precise locations of the foundation and the corner of your building. So what you do is you set up these batter boards and then you string line down to give you the precise locations of what, uh, uh, where your corners are and what you wanna do. And then some different levels, uh, a nice little level you can put on the string. I use a water level too, I like to use those. I do have a laser level, but I prefer using the water level for the foundation. I use this for more interior stuff. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of different size levels for carpentry work. But you can see how the batter boards work here, where you put the string line down and see, put your batter boards in. And so here's an example on my site where you can see these batter boards, uh, my most recent project. And so this, and then a plumb bob. And my daughter working on this project a while. She, uh, she's now 20 and in California in a school in California. That's my son, a little older. This was our furnace book of how to fix the furnace. And I, I forgot he was playing with it out here. I got under the dirt and then we didn't dig it up for like a year with how to fix the furnace. Uh, you wanna get all your water? You wanna get water out of your trenches. That's a big problem, um, a major problem. Even, even in places it doesn't rain so much. I, I was uh, working for developer in San Diego. Uh, I, I wrote a big contract for a couple hundred thousand dollars for a general contractor to build a building. And I put liquidated damages in there, not because of what liquidated damages just means if they're not done on time, they have to pay a penalty. And so they were looking for any kind of allowable delay they could. And they would call me up like at six in the morning, say, oh, the trenches are full of water. I said, well, you're not pouring concrete today. And I know it just rained and it's rare, but that's not an allowable delay. But anyway, you got to keep water off of, out of the trenches. Pennsylvania, we have a lot of water. Um, and so... You see these drain pipes also put up tents. Here's the batter boards with uh, dimensions and things. Uh, this is the sewer line going out to the septic tank. Let's see, uh, batter boards and uh, laying that all out. Now, how far do you go down? This varies by where you are in the country. You got to go below the frost line. When I build in Texas and California, it's often slab on grade because there's no frost. So you just need to have enough concrete and steel to uh, distribute the load onto the top, essentially the top of the first couple of feet of the ground. Here in the Northeast and, also, and even more the case in the Midwest and certainly up in Alaska and further north, you have to go down deep enough that you get where there can't, you can't have the water table or the water uh, freezing and pushing up water expands and pushing up the foundation like you see over here. So I'll just show you that measurements here. Uh, so frost heave is what that's called. And so it's you know just showing it's to code. Now this is built to actually a couple of different codes. I've built to the, uh, to the uh, Boca code and the uniform building code. And uh, there was another one they, um, in Texas. And uh, it's now all to the International Building Code. So I built this to earthquake standards in California, even though it doesn't really need to here, to tornado standards in the Midwest and to all the standards in the Northeast, just to be, you know, worst case scenario. So uh, just extra cautious. But anyway, so here you see the frost line, how deep it needs to be. We're right here in Pennsylvania. You see down here in Texas where I built in California, it's insignificant. I mean, you know, five inches. So, you know, you're going to go down five inches anyway just to get the distribution of load. Um, and 
it varies a little bit by depending on the type of foundation you do and whether you put skirting on piers or spread footings. But you know, they're more or less a certain depth of you know 30 to 36 inches. Uh, um, I'm down 38 inches. I think I put you know 36 inches. Uh, whatever I had on there, it's it's plenty to code. You also uh, here's different kinds of footing. So you want to the footing is to distribute the load that's coming down on your exterior load bearing walls. Uh, the original farmhouse had something like this rubble here, and then uh, I've put block. Uh, this little keyway here is with a support concrete wall to keep it from bulging out or popping in um, with a force more likely going to push in. You know. Uh, so on my project, I put steel, and you won't typically see steel in a residential project. However, there's dissimilar soils here of clay and sand. So you end up with a stress concentrations and different kinds of uh, structural deformations of the soil, depending on load. Uh, normally, you would step down a footing also when you come down an elevation. So uh, some of this footing is down eight feet deep because I didn't want to step it down. I made a continuous pour or you know, allow for a continuous pour with steel to make one uh, monolithic kind of uniform uh, foundation to spread the load, not only hold up the new house, but shore up some of the old farmhouse too, so underpin some of that. First thing you want to do if you're a developer, as a land speculator, and you're just flipping land, even if you're not going to develop, is you want to make sure it's developable kind of soil. So you will do test bores. And this is for structural, you know, finding rocks and things, uh, load bearing properties, as well as you want to understand the, uh, the, 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 the ability for the soil to, to have a drain field if you're putting septic systems in and to drain. Um, uh, it's also a requirement for runoff uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, actually, you have to treat the, the, the water coming off of the roofs of buildings as if it's uh, effluent in a septic field. We had to build a drain field for our Bower Center here because of that. It's a special thing because of our subsurface conditions of impermeable soil and low porosity. But you want to understand your subsurface conditions and what you're dealing with before you ever buy a piece of land. It may not be developable or it'll be very expensive if you're on solid rock and you got to blast it or you can't put in septic or whatever. You, you test bores are one of the first things you do. Often before you even buy a piece of property, you offer to just you, you say, I'll pay for some test boards before I bid. Uh, and so you could see here, uh, so KIPS uh, is a thousand pounds of typical units used for uh, in engineering structural analysis and things. So it's a thousand pounds of force and this per square foot and these different subsurface conditions and the cores and what they can handle. Uh, more detail we want to go into here. This this is not a structural engineering course. We have a very good structural engineering professor here who uh, teaches all this. I've, I've had actually 11 courses related to it. That includes my physics, but so statics, dynamics, strength of materials, material science, separate, so, separate concrete design, separate wood design, separate steel design, separate soil mechanics, also analytical mechanics as a physics grad. But I don't profess to be a structural engineer, even though I did a little bit of it in San Francisco. That's something you want to do for a living and uh, be really good at it before you even do a little bit. I had other people to go over my calculations uh, when I was in my late 20s. And not on houses. Now, you can, you can build buildings like this, residential projects. Uh, architects, they don't, they don't have to be an engineer. You just pull the... The, the the beam sizes out of tables and the, you know the inspectors look at it if you need to need inspection but it's not it's not a major engineering feat for residential projects in wood construction but you talk about uh, major structural problems for uh, for considerations in earthquake places with you know, big foundations on high rises or bridges it's different so these are subsurface conditions here and and where we are uh, soils, you know, geological map foundations. So you should be aware of what you're building on. So that was Pennsylvania. This is Texas. This is my project in Texas. It was a 13 building office park with a couple computer companies. And it's right here. This is Austin, Texas. And, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of pretty right down the middle here. It's similar to the Northeast uh, vegetation and Waco and Dallas up here. Houston gets a little swampy, but it's still not bad. Galveston, Corpus Christi down here. Um, and you know, Mexico over here. The, the West Texas is 
barren, kind of flat. I remember driving 10 hours going to California in a straight line from Austin to the very peak here in El Paso. Uh, and then in California, this project, I had one of seven projects. I had this, my biggest project was this, was uh, a two building complex, a speculative office, 45,000 square foot office park or office building with a uh, 100,000 square foot light manufacturing for a high tech company and office to and R and D. Um, so we built this thing. Uh, for the foundation of the site work, if you find rock, you might need to blast and ham or hammer it. Uh, this is a concern more in the Northeast. Although I take that back. I mean, there were rock, there was some rock deposits, rock places in Texas and in California, uh, not as common as you would find it. And the Northeast is a geologically much older uh, uh, geology. And so yeah, that's where you're gonna find different kinds of rock more prevalent. Um, yeah, so I'll, as I mentioned, I didn't step down. So you see it's, uh, uh, well, it's actually eight feet from up here, but six feet down from the, subs, the soil surface. Didn't have to go to that down that deep, but I didn't want to step it because steps create stress concentrations and cracks and, and dissimilar soils. So I, I don't say I over-engineered it. I think it actually warranted it here for the subsurface conditions. And the fact that I'm underpinning this old 150 year old farmhouse uh, and, and what is why do you put steel in? It has to do with any kind of composite material where part of the material is doing one thing, parts doing another. Uh, concrete is 10 times stronger in compression than steel, uh, but steel is 10 times stronger in, uh, in, in tension. And so when you have bending, the top fiber, you call it, the top part of the beam is in compression, the bottom part's in tension. So you put your steel on the bottom, here's a cross section of this, and then you do your moment of inertia and all your calculations for structural engineering from this kind of thing. But it's a composite material, so you know it's a little trickier because uh, you know, you've got to consider exactly where that steel is and what it's doing, and that it's placed, sized right, and going to be put in place right. Got to lift it up off the ground. So that's what you see right here. The steel, if it was sitting right on the ground, uh, could easily just not even contribute to the overall structure. So you'd want to prop them up. So we made these little lifters. You can buy them too, but I wanted something that was more solid that was stuck there when the poor truck came because we wanted to vibrate it too. You want to vibrate your concrete to get, I, mean, I did it by hand, get all the air bubbles out. So this is steel. <clears throat> Also put up tents, keep the water out. You place concrete, not pour. Keep the trenches dry. Mixed truck came in. Only thing I subcontracted in the whole building, the whole building was the mixed truck and the shingles on the roof. Uh, now, why not mix by hand? It would have taken 235 65 pound bags. And not that I'm adverse to the labor of that, but I'm adverse to the lack of continuous pour and the continuity of the concrete if it was a bunch of patched together bags. It would have been stratified, you know, and, and uh, sectioned. Uh, on big jobs, they bring in pumpers like this. Pumper trucks. Uh, this is where I'm presently built. I have these two parcels here. This one I let get farmed and uh, so I don't have to cut it. And then I fenced off all this for the children and the cats and the dogs and everything. And I built everything here. And there's a barn there. Um, and so it was a hard to reach, reach parcel back here. I almost uh, needed a pumper truck. Uh, unfortunately, I, or fortunately, I convinced the young guy who was driving the truck, just make the turn, don't worry. I uh, almost rolled his concrete truck down this hill. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's a very steep hill, but when you have a, he, I was the first load, first batch in the morning, and it was a full concrete truck, and they're top heavy. So I kind of regret that. Well, I mean, I got the pour done, but uh, the poor kid could have gotten hurt. But uh, I wouldn't have done it if I had to do it again. So foundations, type of foundations, slab on grade. This is what you see in the, and I, we, I did in California and Texas, this kind of thing. If you're in coastal places like in uh, Louisiana or uh, Alabama or certain parts of Florida and the marshes, you do this, or I don't think they show it here, a boat footing where you actually make what looks like a boat, about walls and floors cast all together. So, uh, you know, the whole thing is kind of floating in the marsh like a boat. Um, <clears throat> different kinds of foundations. This is typically what you see here in, in the Northeast 
where you have a slab cut down, you, you dig a trench down below the frost line that kind of warrants doing a, doing a basement since you're already digging down there. Then you do a footing and a block in your slab. A uh, slab on grade looks like this kind of thing. You still need some steel, I mean, because you're holding up load, but you don't have to go way down deep. And then some optional rigid foam, frost protection. I wouldn't do that in California or Texas where I was. Um, and maybe, you know, if I got up near Oklahoma, maybe, but it was never that big of a concern or never is. So slab on grade and slab on grade, buildings I already showed you did. Um, cold climates, you go down below the, you like, you go down below the frost line, so you need basement, or you want the basement, you're down there anyway. Uh, dug all this stuff out by hand. I, it was more of just a fun family project. I priced it at what a backhoe would be per hour and how long that would have taken me to do. And so I did the equivalent of like $2 an hour of labor you know, if I had paid myself for the amount of time it took me to dig by hand 60 cubic yards. But it was fun. So uh, foundations ver transfer vertical gravity loads. So this is structure now. So you got to distribute it. You know, get the loads going out to the. These are spread footings here, and so this is not a continuous band. Uh, here's another kind of piles. You need to do this depending on your subsurface conditions. Uh, they do this. You'll see in New York City a lot to get down the bedrock, uh, which is down deep below the sediment, and other places. Uh, this is piles <laughs> there. Foundation walls need to hold up uh, lateral loads and water mainly. Uh, act as a retaining wall, otherwise it'll blow in there. And, and that means you really need to get the water away from the foundation. And so here's uh, a block wall. I laid 460 block, I think. Like that. And, and oh, all the tools for that, you need line blocks. You got to keep yourself... The course is, you know, straight. You got to keep plumb straight up and down, level, you know, between uh, the, the, the courses and uh, and square, you know, have a 90 degree angle between the seams. Um, and that's no small feat to do right. And so that build and build, build and build. Uh, mortar is just different than plain concrete. It's a special mix is similar. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of aggregate in it. And uh, it's an art to get that mortar joint just right. This is a spread footing underpinning, holding up the main structure, the new house also underpinning the old house. Going down to the spread footing, uh, put steel up the metal. Main structural load girders versus joists, girders, joists, floor beams. So you have different terminology here. So, you know, uh, the girder is the main load bearing thing. And then um, you have a ridge beam that your roof rafters go up to. And then you have floor joists that connect to the girders here. So you want to get those turned on where you see it's correct. Uh, anything vertical is not a beam, that's a post or a column. Um, Uh, here is an example of uh, this was old balloon framing, mortise and tenon uh, pegged uh, rough sawn timber using, uh, somebody told me it was hemlock dipped in creosote and then built 150 years ago by hand, no power tools, and precision cuts everywhere by hand. Really nice work. So I, I'm actually leaving some of that exposed in some of the rooms. But I want to, putting on a new building out here, so I'm sistering on, it's called sistering on another beam on the side with lag bolts, you know, drilled. And you know, you don't want to just drive it straight in, you'll split everything. You got to drill a hole uh, about the size of the screw where the threads are, but not the thread parts that stick out, just the shaft, because you want it to grip. So I'm underpinning the old house in several places as well. And steel, waterproofing, you want to put a parge coat on the exterior. And then also insulate. And then, you know, insulate all around. And then get water away. This is typically called a French drain. It's not exactly a French drain or agricultural tile. This is spiral black tile 
our tile, black pipe. It's called tile. It's not really tile, but it's called that. It's and then that uh, and gravel the right size so it doesn't go in the little holes. There's little holes in the perforations here. Um, and then uh, pour, you know, pipe that out where it goes someplace, not flooding the neighbor's yard, but just away from the new building. And then encase it in concrete so it doesn't get crushed when big trucks come over top. Then you want to put a sill plate so you start your carpentry work. And uh, this will be the, so then we're going to a sequence of wood lectures after this. Uh, you want to anchor bolt it down. You want to prevent it from blowing away in a hurricane or a tornado. Uh, so uplift, you know, it can just shift off the foundation too. So you want to firmly anchor the entire wood structure into the concrete structure, anchor bolt down into concrete that's here in the block. And then uh, it doesn't mention any, I didn't mention it here, but you will only use pressure treated wood everywhere that doesn't rot. Um, even you might say, well, it's up off the ground now. And it's anything down near the foundation, uh, you want to use pressure treated. Okay. So I'll stop sharing here. And um, let me share one more thing here. Um, so I want to go back into uh, where are we? one second. I get rid of the Zoom controls, hide floating meeting controls, and I can see what I'm doing here. Um, in this course that we're in here, you'll see the sequence here. So first was just basic structural concepts. Then we do foundation site work. And this is following the textbook we have here, which is a very nice textbook. This one here, building construction. And then uh, we'll do wood, a number of wood, wood lectures. I don't have any recordings of these, so I'll record the next three lectures. I'll do a couple at a time, uh, probably next time, uh, maybe one at a time. And then we do have recordings. I'll probably do these live, even though I have recordings of all these other things. Uh, so I don't have ones here. I may do recordings of these too. Uh, these I already have as, I just need to save these as MP4s onto the, server and then also upload them to YouTube. For a while, I wasn't putting everything on YouTube, but I think I want to have everything on YouTube and then I'll have separate uh, channels. So I'll show you what YouTube looks like real quickly here. It's my YouTube channel and playlists. And so right now there's uh, 30 family creation, 47 high-tech lectures, 46 travel, 37 high-tech, advanced high-tech lectures, 13 high-tech student works, 81 architectural student works and 42 architectural lectures. So uh, I might break this into different courses, but this is where you'll find all the architectural lectures of different things so far, including architecture theory and Frank Lloyd Wright stuff. Uh, so I'll pack that full. All right. So let's see here. Um, I'm going to end this meeting here. Here we go. End meeting. I'm going to stop recording. Uh -oh. Mr. High Tech Guru up here. I forgot how to get to the any ideas where that where my Zoom controls went? Oh, I, I erased my Zoom controls. They're up here, right? Uh, give them to me. Yeah, they're there. Okay. And now I can stop recording. Yes.